I'll give it 100%. Yeah. <laughs> I think we are. So, hello, people live on Facebook. I believe you're coming in here. Sorry, I'm doing a little housekeeping. Um, I think I'm doing housekeeping. Yeah, there we are. Hey, we're on Facebook. So, uh, welcome everyone to Up Close. Um, Today, my guest is Ron Hippie. Some of you may have read that we were going to have Andrew Heffler from Budapest on, and we will, but it had to be rescheduled. So it'll be coming up, I think, in June. Um, so look for that, but it gives me a chance to talk to, talk to Ron. So before we get into the discussion, um, which lasts about an hour, let me uh, do some of the plugs. All information available on unexpectedproductions.org. <clears throat> A lot of it even in our Facebook page, which you're on right now. So we, we have a bunch of shows. We do Wednesday duos. We have Friday theater sports. Soon we'll have Friday and Saturday theater sports. And currently our um, show is Fact or Fiction. And that's Saturday at 7. So that's tonight at 7. Tonight's theme is ghosts. So come and get spooked. Um, and that's uh, a storytelling show. So you hear three storytellers uh, telling stories from their lives and then we do improv around the, those themes. Uh, we also have classes um, and our quarter is going right now but we also have specialty classes coming up and in June we have a very special uh, offering of international classes where we'll have um, teachers uh, from around the world who will also be teaching our classes and if you like this discussion or just like UP in general you can uh, make a donation at unexpectedproductions.org. And I thought Ron escaped there for a minute. But That's what I was just doing. Donate, <laughs> donate. <laughs> so, uh, cool. Well, thanks for jumping in, Ron. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, several topics, one of which will obviously be music because you're an amazing musician. Um, and we'll talk about improv and whatnot. So let's just uh, jump in. Uh, for those who don't know Ron, he's a longtime UP ensemble member. So I'm sure if you know UP, you've seen Ron. And so I want to start there as I do pretty much every week with every guest with how you found improv and how you got involved in unexpected productions. How I got involved in unexpected productions. Well, I, get, I didn't get involved in unexpected productions. I got involved in Seattle theater sports. And um, <laughs> when I was in high school, and uh, started acting. I went to see theater sports. I was amazed. I couldn't believe it. Uh, <clears throat> I couldn't believe that they were hanging out before the show, just casually chatting and not, you know, nervously wetting themselves backstage. But I go to these shows. I loved it. Couldn't imagine doing it. But then I started taking classes in 88. Actually, before then, Josh Conescu, Josh Conescu, came and worked at my high school. Uh, and I think you came and did some workshops and some other people. Anyway, I took classes, started, uh, I went through, there were three levels back then. There was you and Deidre and uh, Matt Smith, not in that order. And uh, then I started in 1990, I guess was my first show. And uh, from there it was, it was onwards and outwards and uh, always somewhere. <laughs> It's a fascinating story, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, I think that's how everybody uh, joins an improv company, right? You take classes for a while, you hang out, you either have the skill and the and the charm, and then you do it long enough, or you don't. Right. So that's what I did. Yeah, that's most people, sir. I think. And by the way, I'm monitoring the Facebook. If you have questions, let me know. Peggy Reed says, "Hey, Ron." Oh, hey, hey, Peggy. <laughs> <laughs> a long time uh cool and then uh how about music for you um when did you start um or pick up an interest in music or was it something that was forced on you or did you fall in love with it and, and, no i think uh well i think everybody has some connection to music and um again it's not that amazing i you know i loved music as a kid we had music growing up and my brothers i had three older brothers they had a lot of records, 70s albums and whatnot. So I grew up with that kind of ilk. And then uh, they actually, my or we had a piano, that's right. We had a, a this amazing upright uh, piano from Chicago. I don't remember the brand, but it was a, from like, you know, 19, 
my my youngest son would say 19 too, uh, but it was from the, the early part of the century. Awesome, you know, you could take the front off and you could see the hammers and it was a gigantic, just a beautiful wood finished uh, piano and we had that my whole life and uh, I loved it, I loved it. And so when I was a teenager, you know, I'd get sheet music of music that I knew and I'd practice it and learn it and kind of figure it out. It's, it's like hieroglyphics, you know, looking at the sheet and, uh, <clears throat> bought a guitar, bought some other stuff, should have just bought more, but I was cheap. And the, over the years, it was kind of a side thing. So I just kept playing and playing. And I didn't actually play for theater sports until actually the, the 2000s. I never imagined uh, playing for a show, but um, uh, it was around that time I was in LA and I was uh, working with the, the uh, theater sports group there. And I realized uh, that it's not about proficiency or being the most talented. In fact, that can get in the way. It's actually about just being an improviser, using this as a tool and making offers. Um, you have to have some vocabulary musically and some ability, but you don't have to, most people uh, sell themselves short on how much they can really do, so. So along those lines, <clears throat> as an, let's talk uh, improvisation, um, uh, improvisational music right now. Yeah. Um, what, you know, like if you're going to teach somebody three skills, like these are three things you have to know if you're going to improvise music uh, or underscore scene or, or, or do something like that. What would be those like three, three or more things? I'd say uh, guilt tripping. No, um, I'd say uh, three skills. Well, okay. You know, I'll say, you know, somebody like uh, I'm going to give a plug here. Alex Engelberg, uh, resident genius. Uh, there's many, many other musicians that can talk music theory and with a lot more expertise than I. Um, I'm a real novice with that. So again, I'm approaching this as an improviser, more as an improviser than a musician. But I will say, you just simply have to learn some basics about, about chords, uh, about what chords fit in the right key. Real simple stuff can be, can be helpful. You know, just learning basic um, uh, triad chords, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's a, a root, a uh, third and a fifth, and then learning the, you know, where where to go for uh, from there, like if you're in C, if you're going to go to F and G, or if you're in D and you're going to go to G and A, and then you can just stick around that, and it's amazing how much you can get out of a lot of uh, simplicity, you know, music a lot of times can just be one note, and it can affect so much more than complicated stuff, so uh, step one, just learn a few basic keys, and how to play those chords. Uh, step two, learn how to improvise. <laughs> That's a whole other thing, you know, just learn how to listen for offers. And <laughs> you're making emotional offers if you're scoring a, a show or you're making specific, uh, you're, you're providing a bed for somebody to sing on top of if you're playing music, but um, just listening as an improviser and listening for offers. Right. And then uh, what's the third thing I'd say? Um, uh, I'd say learn how to uh, learn how to drink a whiskey. <laughs> learn how to drink a whiskey. Get a little relaxed before the show. Get a little goes. relaxed is what I'd say. <laughs> this is just lemon water. I'm just drinking lemon water. <coughs> a little relaxed. Cool. And then the uh, flip side of that in terms of onstage improvisers, uh, I guess my yes. uh, two sides of a coin. One is what advice would you give or do you give? Because I know you teach... Uh, you know, improvised musical singing. I do, and uh, I provide far more detail than I just did. There. So <laughs> trust me, folks. Right, it's right. worth you, it. You have to pay for that. But uh, yeah. <laughs> so, what it would be a couple tips you'd give people for just like relaxing and getting uh, uh, used to singing? And how do you think, or, or have you noticed how people, when they're on stage improvisationally singing, how do they kind of? trip themselves up make it more difficult than they need to or you know so what, what could they let go of you know when, uh, rhymes and words rhymes and words yeah people are really fo hyper focused on rhymes uh you know the rhymes are like the money shot of the whole the whole thing but it's like it's not necessary and it's also can be uh it, it uh makes people um when you're singing and improvising you're thinking of content, you're coming up with words, you're coming up with melodies, you're trying to fit it into rhythms. Maybe you're actually dancing or moving in some way too, and you're acting, right? So there's so much to think about that you wanna simplify. There's too much information happening in your brain. 
So you want to automate as many of those things as possible. You know, you don't want to be focus the same way you don't focus on putting one foot in front of the other you focus on other things other than your feet make as much automated as possible so just the more you can just get used to singing without worrying about you know where you're going and just singing along with records or sing along with sounds and objects that you hear in your everyday life uh that's you know it really that get, get that so that it's automatic so you're not focused on that then you can focus on things like words and poetry and lyrics, and then you can focus on maybe even rhyming. But most people put in too many words into the amount of space. I liken it to um, like a, a painting, right? So you've got a finite amount of space, and the more you fill, the less space there is. And then eventually it just becomes all dark, right? Completely filled. So music, if it's all filled, is just overwhelming sound. So sing less leave space leave space for your musician for your companies leave space for your fellow singers people fill up the space too much and it's usually because of nerves usually they're just too scared and they uh they, they just think that they got to do as much as they can and dance as fast as they can or the audience is going to get mad at them and that could happen and that's happened for sure to me and to you i'm sure mr mm -hmm. dixon mm -hmm. oh yeah so, so yeah, that's, that's uh, uh, and what else? Um, what was the other question? Singing on stage, people, what, uh, they just- well, what, what tips you'd have for them and also what are the things that trip us up? So too many- Yeah, words, so that's, and, and, and <clears throat> you know, one thing that I do in my class that I found really helpful is uh, we play an exercise where, because if you throw somebody, especially somebody who's maybe not somebody who doesn't have a lot of confidence singing in general, you know, they're just, that's not their thing. And it's, so they're just not, they're, they're not ready. They're not stretched. They're not warmed up. They're not ready to go. You just say, okay, here's some music, sing along, you know, start coming up with rhyming couplets and have it sound good and all the rest. Then, then, you know, they short circuit. But I do this exercise where we get up and we do, um, you know, the game uh, telephone. So you got people lined up in a row and they're all speaking and they're they're uh, they're hearing each other, but they're not really fully hearing each other. They're just gleaning little words or, or ideas off each other, and they're incorporating that into their dialogue, into their phone conversations. So we do that, and we do a sequence of these where there's some where there's just sounds and emotion. You know, first it's the people talking, and then we take away the words, and it's just people you, you know speaking, but the language, but without the words. So it's one dog. Ah, oh, waha madigo. Oh, yo, la mama, you know, it's all of that kind of thing. And then, and then it's just there's no language; it's just music. And then, then we take away the speaking, and we just make it music, like you're an instrument. And then we add back words by the end of it, and so it's kind of like destroying it and then resequencing it so that you you can kind of look at it as it's not so uh, it's not such a mystery it's, it's very simple you know to do this stuff is very simple and the mystery comes from just having it all sort of obscuring your your field of vision at once but if you can take it apart and focus on each aspect and you put it back together i find that it's easier and i see students that you know they can they can tackle it easier and tackle a song you know how to get up and and sing a song then with with uh, and and learning these these component parts. Like I say, like you you know you never this is another metaphor I use, but you never just nobody gives you a keys to a car and says go. You have to learn all the steps and stages, and you got to practice each one, and then put it together, assemble it all together, and then uh, then you got to crash the car a few times, crash Daddy's T bird. <laughs> so anyway, cool. And then um, kind of. Uh, blurring the lines because you, know, you have a band, you're a songwriter, um, you do lots of music outside of improvisation. Um, I'm just curious about like your composition method. Do you find yourself noodling around improvisationally and then finding a song or does something pop in your head or both? Or, you know, is, is there a difference between like if I just sit down at a keyboard and I'm underscoring a scene and thinking a mood or a, a genre or whatever, versus sitting down to go, oh, I'm going to try to write a song. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot there. And um, yes, I'll unpack it. I'll unpack it now. Um, the genius, the songwriting. No, um, I think songwriting, let me hit that second. Underscoring a scene is fun. And it's really kind of almost, I don't want to say it's 
it's not that it's not it's it's it can be difficult to do it well and it's not that it's mindless but it's so just simple and you, you can really relax and you're just basically watching a scene and just grad, adding a note or two maybe and then occasionally maybe some some underscore like me, actual music with you know chords and stuff but a lot of times it's so subtle and, uh, and that's fun because the pressure's off you you know nobody's paying attention to your underscoring unless they're a musician and that's usually what um uh, you know this. I go to the silent movies down at the uh, uh, Paramount Theater every every year. I go to as many of them as I can, and uh, that's what the uh, accompanists all, always say. There is that they if their greatest gift is that you you forgot that they were playing, right? Because if they're if you're focused on the playing, then they're not doing their job. That you should be focused on the the story. So, and that's the same thing with improv. It's so simple and subtle, and. Uh, it's amazing how, you know, I, you just, I, I would say, do less, do less. It's like somebody who's trying to sc score a scene, just do less, do less. And, and, but find the right spots. It's, you know, it's knowing those, those finding the right spaces to fill. Like Andy Summers of the police guitarist. But as far as songwriting goes, I mean, everybody's got their own style. And what is a song is so vast. Like what is a good or a bad song? I hate judgment and categorizing music like that because I think it's all comprised of the same component parts. Um, but I'll say, okay, if writing a song, like for me, uh, there's, it, it really depends on the instrument and, and my personal, uh, I personally find that I love being, uh, put into a, a primitive state, not primitive, a, 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 a primary state or something where I'm, where I, where I'm brand, like giving me an instrument that I've never played before. Uh, I can discover more originality than on something that I've already played and already even maybe written a song or 10 or 100 on because music can get really cliched after a while. You know, you play the same instrument, you get caught in the same chord fingerings and the same voicings. And, and I love being shattered out of that, which is why, you know, writing by myself is one thing, but it's just like improvising by yourself. You know, it's so hard to just sit. You and I could both... and hundreds of other improvisers could sit down by yourself and improvise a story because we know how to beginning, middle and end. And we know how to add characters and we can do that. But after about four or five scenes by yourself, you just get bored. You need another person to surprise you and stimulate you, right? It's the same thing with music. Some other uh, musician comes in and starts playing something and I go, whoa, that's cool. I never would have thought of that. So now I'm actually <coughs> creating, I'm in that creative space that improv provides right and you can't get there by yourself or you, you it's much harder to get there by yourself and much more boring which is why um during quarantine people say hey would you use this opportunity to write your great american novel and and symphony and whatnot and my answer is no <laughs> no no inspiration no uh i don't know you know this whole like just being isolated has for me not it's just kind of like shut shut yourself down and go into hibernation until you can get back. I, I uh, it's important to, to have other people, you know, to cut to bounce stuff back and forth with and and argue with and say no, no, I don't agree with that. But at least you know that's that's some connection rather than uh, I'm kind of speaking to my guitarist Jan there. We always argue <laughs> the most simple or in hindsight inane things about tones of sound or measures of this or that edit so anyway i just think uh i don't know anybody else out there you, anybody else uh, uninspired by being all by yourself some people think this really cool and it's like i can just do my thing now and and some things i've been able to do that with i mean like it seems like house things like you know working around the house is easier but there's no motivation for any of that other stuff yeah i would i would agree I talk to people who are like, well, I, I learn Spanish. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I wish I had. <laughs> I just am glad I each day if I shower, uh, so, you know, <laughs> the accomplishment. But good times are here, huh? Everything is optimistic now. We're singing a happy song. Right. We're going to be dancing in the streets, literally. <sighs> Two um, song references back to back. <laughs> Playing all the hits. So. Cool. Um, so now you're on stage improv. Yeah. Um, I don't know. What do you have particular forms or games that you like? I mean, you do a lot of theater sports, um, primarily theater sports, I would say, through through UP, direct and put together some long forms. 
uh, for our earlier slots back when we were all uh, live. But is there a particular kind of angle, you know, bent that you have in what turns you on improv wise from a performer's standpoint, a stage performer? Musically or just in general? No, just in general. Oh, well, there's been a real shift. I mean, it, we're coming back out of this weird uh, blip pause in the whole, you know, cat, spectrum of, of like our improv history of UP and, and in general. So, and, and for a multitude of reasons, we're not returning to the same world. And so there's a lot of things that are outdated. It's a lot of things that are just, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like, you, you know, the earthquake comes and you clean up and you go, you know what, a lot of this stuff was clutter. I didn't realize how much it was. So I'm really looking forward to like, what's going to be different and what's going to be new. And I want to find new ways to have things be supremely connected audience wise, like, like a, a cycle of like a lot of this, a lot of like more involvement back and forth, you know, internally within a scene. And I'm not talking about, cause I hate games. Maybe I have, it's easier to come games. I don't like, <clears throat> I hate the games that are, um, you know, I don't like question period because it's a, for other reasons, but, <laughs> but I hate the games if the audience is starting and stopping you too much because then it becomes a, a gimmick where they have you on a leash, but finding other interesting new ways. I'm, I'm inspired to find ways to how, uh, and a lot of it comes down to this. I mean, we've had this, this technology that's been injected into what we're doing. We're doing these hybrid shows. We're doing strictly online shows. We're going to be strictly in-person shows and everything is kind of different now. It just feels, feels like a, it feels like a modern time. It feels like we really went into the year 2000 right now. You know, we're coming into the future. This feels like the future to me. In, in every way, it feels like the future society-wise, but it also feels like the future in what we're talking about and what we're doing in improv. And I find that to be extraordinarily um, bewildering, but also inspiring. And uh, it's gonna be an interesting ride. But as far as specific games that I really like playing, um, uh, I, I'm less, I'm more inclined to uh, games and where time can be taken on stage, where moments can can be uh, acted. I guess I'm looking forward to chewing the scenery a little bit and overacting and ham boning it up in my inimitable style of eye bugging out and uh, all the rest. I just uh, I want to get up and flex on stage. I want to I want to hear people and see people. Thanks for tuning in to my therapy session, folks. <laughs> Glad that you could all participate. <laughs> right. <laughs> cool. Uh, and I know I'm kind of all over the place topic-wise, but... Uh, That's fine, because I'm really focused in, on my answers, right? No, no. But uh, um, one thing I've been asking people, especially um, obviously people that teach, and you have a long uh, teaching history as well, um, in terms of... Um, what classic sort of traps do students fall into? Um, you know, like part of it is a lot of people have talked about, and I think about it a lot, that kind of self-judgment, which we already brought up. Um, but are there other like classic traps um, that students fall into and you just kind of go, why do they always fall into that trap? Well, I think that it's interesting, kind of back to this whole thing about this is a societal thing to some degree now, but it's for me, I've always preached that improv. I'll tell people that it is a, it's a gift to be aggressive on stage. It's a gift. And, and I, I want to be clear what I mean by aggressive. It's a gift mm -hmm. to be assertive in your offers. It's a gift to be, to define. It's a gift to tell somebody where they are for what they're doing. Now it's rude to, to, to take all of that from the rest of the players and to, to be the only one to, to be allowed to define everything. But the beginning improvisers are often too polite and too nice with each other because we want to be polite and nice in society. But what we're doing as improvisers is we're telling stories and no story is without some form of impoliteness because all stories are about an imbalance. So 
whatever the good world is that you are displaying has to have some impoliteness to imbalance it to at least get it back to good again. Otherwise, you don't have stories. You just have people sitting and, and having tea. And so <clears throat> if you're too polite and letting everybody else do everything, then it's basically like saying, well, why don't you make the dinner and why don't you design the party and why don't you do, I'll show up though. So I say really encourage yourself to get out there. Now, of course, we all know, you know, blowhards and loudmouths and uh, and perhaps we've even uh, been them ourselves. Mm -hmm. But, um, and I'm not talking about that. We all know if somebody's the loudmouth who doesn't let anybody get a word in. That's not what I'm talking about. And that's a different issue and no, we don't, that's no good. But that's the thing that I am often uh, uh, encouraging and tutoring beginning improvisers to do. And that's, and, and, it's, and it's, it's a good thing. In high school, like when you teach the high school improvisers and Michelle and I laugh about this a lot, you know, they, any sort of insult, like in a scene, somebody comes in and says that, that hat you're wearing is ugly. Now, as adults, we'd say, whoa, what a great offer. Now that person has something to do to buy a new hat or whatever. But of course, when you're younger or beginning improviser, they flip out and they're like, oh my God, what an insult. This scene is insane. This has gone off the rails. But that's what you need. You gotta have something to happen. You need Darth Vader in order to have, name your hero. There's a lot of them. Um, so anyway, uh, that's something that I find. And what was the other question? I think there was only one you're on. That was it, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, when I talk about it to students, especially, I call it committing it to history. So if I come in and say, you know, well, Dr. Wright, uh, I'm not feeling well and my chest hurts. Well, I've defined things, defined you as the doctor that I have chest pains or whatever. And that's committed to history. And people are, uh, as you were sort of alluding to, um, oftentimes the students will be like, oh, no, you go, you go. What, what, you got something? All right, no, you go, I'll, I'm fine. And if everybody's doing that, then nothing happens. So. Yeah. And, and I'm a big fan of danger, but of course, again, I'm very clear that this is, I'm talking about danger in the imaginary world. I'm not talking about real danger. Nobody wants to be dropped on their head or nobody wants to be touched in the wrong way. And nor should anybody be any of these things. But in the scenes, your characters can get dropped on their heads all they want because they're fictitious characters. And uh, <clears throat> so of course, within reason, but um, yeah, teaching is, uh, well, that's a whole thing. You know, I haven't been doing any of the online teaching uh, um, but I'm kind of, I'm in close communication with a number of people who have, so I kind of get it. I've done a little tiny bit, but, um, you know, it's, uh, I'm such a fan. I love teaching and I love doing, here's another answer to your, one of your questions. I, I love scenes from nothing and I love teaching them. And they're so hard for, to people, for people to comprehend for the longest time until they really actually get how utterly simple a scene from nothing is, but we, we, we are so worried about, um, you know, getting to, to the clutter, but I love teaching scenes from nothing because it just causes, it, it shows you, it's such a lesson for me that about how it's the same, you know, cliche about how there's music everywhere, you know, oh, music in the tree, you hear the rustling of the leaves and it's music and it is, it actually is. Same <laughs> thing with improv, like the offer can come from literally lights up and all you do is you know, raise your eyebrow. And that's, that's massive. And, uh, and again, it's the same thing with music. And it's all about removal, removal of, of clutter. So the only way an eyebrow raise makes any impact is if everything else is removed, and it's quiet and still and empty. But if there's music and dancing and jumping, then the eyebrow raise gets lost in it. And the same thing with music. Uh, when we're mixing, uh, when we're mixing and arranging songs, me and my bandmates, most of the time, what we're doing is removal, pruning out. You add a bunch of stuff, and then you prune out anything that's unnecessary, and you discover the, the core, the fundamental core. And it's simple. It's like, wow, it was there all along. We just had to just simplify it. Same thing with you know, improv, scenes from nothing. Just bring it all down, discover it, and then, boom, you're off and running, and you can come up with all the complicated stuff. But <laughs> I love that. I love scenes from nothing. And you yeah. should, too. Mm -hmm. Order now. I do. I like scene from nothing. <clears throat> Although I often thought it should have been called scene from one thing or scene from something. Yeah. Because it's like you do have to have that first offer 
that comes out of seemingly nowhere, but you still have to have that first offer. Um, to well, but that's the thing is I always say it's not an offer. Hopefully in a perfect world, you don't actually manufacture it. I talk a lot about um, discovery versus manufacture. So in your scene work, are you, are you manufacturing or are you discovering? And discovering means just be quiet and look and, look and listen. And then suddenly you, you will discover, oh, there's a spider, right? That's, you didn't create a spider. As opposed to seeing you, lights come up and you say, you know, ah, Spider-Man, hey, Peter Parker, here we are, we're in the lab, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Which I love that too, and I do a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> you caught me. So <laughs> in your uh, long history with uh, UP, um, how way back when, um, how, uh, how, has, how have things changed? I mean, obviously when we moved into the market theater in 91, uh, a lot of stuff changed because also we had this space we had to fill. Um, prior to that, when we were at the group theater and at, um, uh, <clears throat> sorry, Intamon, um, we had a little more room to grow. But in terms of Ron Hippie growing up in improv uh, from the time you were a child, um, what, what have your observations been about like how either the culture has changed, the work has changed? Um, just curious you know there, it has changed in so many ways but ultimately it's going to be one of these cliches where you come back and you say but it was actually you ron who was changing all along <laughs> everything's been the same you have now perceived it differently due to your age and accumulated wisdom so yeah that's what's going to be the the end of this story but in my journey what's changed are a, a number of things for one thing improv has become a uh, popularized and and um and uh sold you know but manufactured i don't know um commercial not commercialized but it's popularized and i'm no longer trying to ex long-windedly explain it i can just say it's like whose line is it anyway and everybody goes oh yeah i get it so because improv was a mystery when i first started it was a magical strange thing that these gypsy performers would sweep in and do and you'd say wow how did they do that and then they'd be off and then the night and you're gone um but now it's like, oh yes, of course. There's, you know, every every college and high school and, and community has their own, you know, the senior center here has senior citizens. Yeah, they're the old folks and they do their, I mean, it's everybody does, you know, freeze tag or something. So that's one thing that's different. The other thing that's different is, uh, and maybe it's because of, or vice versa, <clears throat> it used to be for me, and perhaps because I was coming at it from a more theatrical mind, but it used to be theater sports it was theater sports this was something that wasn't a comedy thing nor was it a uh, it it wasn't really a, a mass cultural thing it was just it was theater you were taking theater so there was so much more to me it felt like there was so much more emphasis on like you know doing playwright styles and let's show ibsen and let's show x y and z and Perhaps back then, just as few people knew any of these playwrights as they do today, but I definitely know that nobody, you know, nobody knows any of these playwrights in our common, like, you know, the, like the, the late night drunk crowd. Uh, mm -hmm. That's more for the, the people that come for long forms and the, that are interested in the theater portion. And it, it just feels to me like it's more television, uh, online sports, uh, zapper, phone looking sports instead of theater sports. And it seems that, and this is a good thing, good or bad, it seems like because of that, it's not something that only actors could do. Everybody can improvise now. I think our company is, it felt like in the back in the old days, it was comprised of predominantly actors with some non-actors, but you know, now it's like, it seems like it's literally just everybody, which is cool because you don't have everybody echo chambering. They're saying like, oh, it has to be done this way. It must be done this way. It's like, no, it can be done in this way too. And it can also be done this way. And it can also be done this way. Even though it's like, that blows my mind. That's so much lower energy, higher energy, farther, you know, so that's changed. Um, and the other thing that's changed is everybody's gotten so much younger. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. That's ridiculous. Um, <clears throat> Yeah. And I and then of course uh the format, here's another thing that's changed outside of improv. Whether improv's changed that much or not, I don't know, but I do say, and here's my my true 
honest pillar thought. And that is that the world has changed because of improv. I see the application <clears throat> of yes and in so many more phases of society than I ever did. And it's actually spoken to, it will be re referenced as saying, this is an improv tool. This is something that we use in the corporate world, or this is something that I see referenced, you know, like Amy Poehler and the, these, uh, the, these uh, Upright Citizens Brigade people who are now famous talk about it all the time. And this proselytization, proselytization of improv, I really think impacts people in like groups and societies without even knowing it. They'll start, they're going to be starting doing subconscious yes anding the more that it gets put out there. Uh, the more of these, uh, what's the Stephen Colbert um, speech that he makes, the uh, um, uh, the graduation speech, wasn't that Stephen Colbert? And he's talking about um, yes and, all of that. And I think it's going to infect, because yes and, as you well know, and as all of you tuning in who are probably improvisers and teachers and all of that, it creates things. It creates ideas. And ideas become science. Ideas become arts. Ideas become, you know, architecture and new designs. And, and everything is an idea. And ideas are the best thing that we have. And the best way to get ideas is to use yes and, and to use improv skills. And so, you know, hey. But then again, it was you who changed, Ron, all <laughs> along. We've been here waiting for you. You've been wearing your ruby slippers the entire time. Yes. So, um, while, well, um, <laughs> since you brought it up, <clears throat> and for those out there that don't know, uh, Ron works with UP as well on, on you know, our corporate clients. Um, and uh, something Please call I, this number right now. Yeah, that's right. Here, we should have a little thing at the bottom. You can, you can learn the same. But I guess. Um, and maybe uh, maybe this is the answer to the question. I remember when I was working, uh, trying to sell corporate workshops to people, it was always difficult to sell the process of improv in a product-oriented society. So people would always be like, well, what's the take home? And what are we gonna get? And it'd be like, well, you're not getting really anything, you're doing, and by doing, you're getting whatever whatever you get out of it. Is it still true, or because of all the stuff you were talking about earlier about where improv has appeared on TV and books and the whole yes and stuff, is it in a way not easier, but is is it less difficult to try to get that across to corporate clients? Do do they get it now? I tell them if they want if they aspire to be game show hosts, <laughs> they'd better practice. <clears throat> no, uh, there's a lot more buy-in these days, and again, uh, you know, there's you. You can reference articles that are in, you know, reputable uh, publications. You know, I mean, whatever. There's New York Times articles, etc., all the time that um, talk about this, talk about the the value of improv in the corporate world, and and you know, and because of it's a lot of C's. I find myself talking about to people. It's collaboration. It's creativity. It's communication. Um, uh, the, the it's it's all of these things you know you can take any one of those and you can spoke out from there and 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 see how what practical um applications that has in your team so and teams often struggle for various reasons and teams can often uh, not struggle for the flip side of those various reasons and so and i see a lot of teams that are you can tell right away uh oh this one's a little fractured and no oh, this team's really solid they're really connected and a team doesn't have to be a big corporate boardroom, you know, it can be a small anything. It could be your team could be a social gathering that you have that just is trying to create or organize something. It could be, you know, it could be a business, it could be a, a, a band, any number of things. We're humans and it's just all about connecting. Right, right. Yeah, it's a, <clears throat> yeah, I find in talking, especially doing the class, it's a, for a corporate client it's it's a lot easier to kind of get stuff across so you know, corporate somebody... clients see <laughs> i made that up <laughs> corporate clients that's a different chord right there see how simple it is <laughs> corporate clients oh incredible <laughs> right well while you're at the keyboard oh 
Can have you play some more, because uh, one of the topics I wanted to get to about getting back to music is, and you mentioned it earlier. I think in the very first couple of things you were saying about um, playing less and also using silence. Um, and so, how do you, as a improv composer, uh, think about that? You know, through the process as you're playing, and then you think, oh, I'm going to put a silence in here, or does it just sort of I just stop whenever as an uh, improv composer I'm terrible at it it's always <laughs> in retrospect I mean I'm always thinking oh damn it I totally overplayed that song ah next time I'll get them and right. uh and I rarely do but but I strive to so uh it's a thing you just got to remind yourself yeah I've told this story so many times you maybe you've heard it but um uh, a great old improviser from the old days named Chard Hogan Mm -hmm. good old chart was on a, an improv team with me when we were back at the Intamon and uh, we, uh, <laughs> we, I was, we were so green very young and uh, uh, I think maybe Barb was on our team I don't remember but I know he was on my team and before the show we had a, a mantra and I don't remember what it was but it was some kind of mantra like um, you know eye contact or something and we thought we got to remind ourselves eye contact and so we wrote it on a piece of paper and we wrote big letters, eye contact, and we put it right at the foot of the stage where we'd be going on for every scene. It was going to be there. So you'd get, you'd, you know, you'd get up and you'd look down, you'd say, I can, then, then it would infuse itself into your work. Eye contact. Well, anyway, the lights went down, the show started. Ah, we jumping around, the, you know how you do when you're young and crazy. You're about jumping around. Whole show's crazy. We're sweat. End of the show. Yeah, that was a great show. And then we look down and there's this crumpled up ball of paper. We open it, it says eye contact. <laughs> we didn't ever even for we remember we didn't remember it at all. As soon as the lights hit, our adrenaline took over and we failed at that simple task of just remembering this one thing because all the rest of the show took over. You know how nerve-wracking it is to be, especially as when you're a beginning improviser, get on stage in front of a group of people with no script. Oh my god. So that's again that lesson that I'm reminding myself constantly and it doesn't mean that I'm always succeeding it just means that I'm always that I've already learned this lesson and I've succeeded in the past and I have to remind myself to always succeed it doesn't mean that I automatically will succeed every time same thing and I'll, I'll play too much and then I say oh, okay darn it next time so <laughs> that was my long-winded story Chard Hogan if you're out there well, yeah, remember a few things yeah, where is chart? Let's, uh, who knows? We should have a, a 1 800 number. You could call. <laughs> See, <simple. laughs> I think people want their money back, Randy. Yeah, no, they're fine. So, uh, another topic this goes back in uh, both of our histories a few years. Um, you directed our, <clears throat> we've done Improvised Shakespeare for since oh, yeah. the 80s. And in the 90s, it was the 90s, I believe. We are, uh, was it the 90s? Early oh, 2000s. That was the 2000s. Yeah. yeah. You're talking yeah. about the Shakespeare, the Colorado. The Shakespeare, Colorado Shakespeare Festival. Yes. Yeah. And you did it two years, two years in a row? Yes. Well, yeah, it was, uh, yes, we did it because we did it. The impetus was that uh, we had um, Tristan, Tristan Devon, uh, his father, Dick Devon, worked at uh, the Colorado Shakespeare Festival in Boulder and uh, was connected through, uh, I think it was through um, Brian Kamioka, whatever, through the theater. Anyway, um, so they were interested in maybe having a show that could come out there, blah, blah, blah. So uh, yeah, I uh, directed a pretty simple, you know, just basically what we did was we worked on reading Shakespeare, just practicing, getting up and reading actual Shakespeare scripts watching a lot of Shakespeare, discussing the language, discussing, you know, and practicing with the language and then practicing with the different tropes of Shakespeare and the different, you know, the, the comedies versus tragedies and the histories, what's the difference and all that. So it wasn't, <clears throat> wasn't a much of a reinvention of any wheel. It was just learning Shakespeare really well and then doing it, uh, you know, 60, 90 minutes, whatever. And uh, so we did, we went to, uh, but we did it in tandem here. We did it, uh, in Seattle at the market and then went it was vice you see one way or the other we either did it in Seattle and then went to Colorado or we went to Colorado and then brought it back to Seattle and then the next year we uh 
uh, Michelle and I had our first baby. And so I was pretty, uh, like we had a brand newborn. And uh, so I was a little in and out of it. But um, the third year after that, um, the uh, management changed at the Colorado Shakespeare Festival and they wanted to do something different. And uh, that was the end of that. But it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of fun. And the thing that, oh yeah, the thing that, that's right. The thing that, um, this is something I like. Uh, I like having nothing but I also like having something sometimes. And as you recall, uh, we had uh, the, uh, one of the visual elements of that show was having costumes, a plethora of costumes on racks on stage so that the actors would, would dress in front of the audience. And this is not any new theatrical convention. It's you know used by a lot of directors and it's really simple and effective because uh, for one thing, uh, reminds everybody of the about how the whole thing every aspect of the show is improvised so that so that you can see that the person's selecting their hat that they haven't decided in advance <clears throat> so it just is a constant reminder that it's improvised but it also keeps the actors in on the stage and in the action without having to go because once you go backstage looking for hats you don't listen anymore and you're disconnected and what the, the other thing though that it brought was it just uh, really made it look great you could putting on a play to armor makes you move in a certain way that you wouldn't if you're sitting in your mm -hmm. jeans so uh that was fun and, and that's something <clears throat> i'd like to find ways to reincorporate it technically going forward this is back to your earlier question uh about you know the future and stuff um i'm not a big fan as you recall you know there was the old days of scarves in garbage bag garbage cans and all that and they had their their benefit but i don't like in our theater having stuff because props and stuff, we don't have the room. Second of all, they just get broken. And third of all, uh, it it's distracting from just your basic improv show. But if there's a specific show, like, you know, you wear costumes in uh, like the last few years, there's been these style shows that, that I've seen, mm -hmm. there's costumes backstage. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I like those production values. The converse is of course that um, if you have real costumes and props, then when you fake a gun, then it looks weird because everybody else has real props and you don't. So that's a tricky thing. But I like the idea of technical, including more technical stuff, like green screen backgrounds in our theater uh, that the actors on stage can have the background change, you know, a la, uh, what is it, Colin Mockery that did that a lot on uh, Who's Line? Things like that, just technical things that are that were either seemed like too much of a hassle before we all got thrown into the Zoom world, but now seem much easier or have much more in immediate value, I think. Yeah, it was um, having been in the Shakespeare show in Colorado, it was really interesting to sort of see. I mean, I love the costume aspect. I love that we got to perform on one of the sets, an yeah. actual set <laughs> with yes. lighting. Uh, was pretty cool it was also pretty terrifying though because you're going to the colorado shakespeare festival and performing improvised shakespeare for a bunch of people who know shakespeare uh, shakespeare bigwigs <laughs> and uh so that so was always the battle with underscoring is just being able to f you spend most of your time searching for the right sounds the right timbre right. so right. that you know, like a harpsichord is obviously a, a good Shakespeare uh, realm, but other weird things are maybe not Shakespeare. You know, you got some funky bass, but that's that's another thing with the with the musician. You spend so much of your time not even playing music or thinking about music. You're just thinking, which you know patch, which patch has you know those 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 really cool strings. Oh my God! It's, and then you're scrolling and you're like, oh shoot, that's a trombone. And by then the scene's moved on. Anything that takes you out of the scene is, you know, just was really bad for improv. So if you, anyway, and I love, you know, like Jason has been doing a great job with our underscoring of our shows now. And I love it because he's got so much at the touch of a finger that that uh, can play automatically, you know, fully orchestrated arranged right. songs that you can just go click and he can also play on top of. Anyway, are you a fan of uh, so like you're playing harpsichord for, you know, if you're doing Shakespeare theme? Would you ever kind of go a little more esoteric in terms of that? You know, like imagining we were doing a modern production. Of, of course. Oh, yeah. You could do it. I mean, for one thing, it's improv. So anything that happens, you know, if somebody farts, you got to have a fart. But uh, um, <clears throat> I didn't, by the way. That wasn't me. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, oh, yeah, sure. And I love that if you're doing Shakespeare and suddenly, you know, there's like disco music and stuff. And 
the, it's the whole thing about just mix it, I, try it. It's the, I, I talk a lot about, you know, the, in, uh, I, I'm often regurgitating the same uh, metaphors, but um, uh, it's the uh, Reese's peanut butter cup thing. You know, it's your chocolate got it, my, your peanut butter got in my chocolate. Mm. You know, those commercials, right. and it's the same thing. <clears throat> it's like, let's, let's combine, you know, Shakespeare and disco. I mean, that obviously that's what everybody does. Everybody's done. I don't even think there's a, there's possibly any possible world that Shakespeare hasn't been reinterpreted into it, from, you know, the hip hop to the uh, old pop to the pop tarts to this and that. I mean, <laughs> so. Right. Pop tart ahead. Shakespeare. Huh? It sounds uh, intriguing <laughs> <laughs> and delicious. Uh, <laughs> I haven't even, I gotta, I gotta bring out the guitar. Yeah. I think a guitar is harder to do an improv show with. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask if there's a difference. I think piano. so, because I always find a piano is a lot easier. Um, it depends on what you're trying to do, but the piano can really underscore so much more. And you can also have such a range of, again, timbres of sounds that you don't have necessarily with a guitar unless you have a pedal that's got crazy effects in it. But this keyboard, simple keyboard, has got, you know, probably a couple hundred sounds that I can scroll through and just push one button and I'm underscoring a multitude of scenes. But with the guitar, you got the, you got the country, 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 country. <laughs> oh, Randy, it's been so nice to chat with you today. <laughs> wow, I didn't know I was gonna get serenaded. That's well, nice. you better put out. <laughs> Wow. And do you uh, make different choices with the instrument? So like you're saying, you know, there's not as much variety in terms of the guitar. So do you find yourself playing less or do you find yourself using it differently than you would say a keyboard where you can change it to a harpsichord or even to a guitar if you wanted to? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the guitar and the keyboard have some natural keys that are easier or harder to play in. That's just based on physiology of the instrument. I guess physiology, that would refer to like actual human organic matter, right? Mm -hmm. But the uh, design and structure of the instrument um, because they're laid out differently. A piano is so nice and sequential. It goes fr from the lowest to the highest. Every now and then you gotta kind of go jag left and right here, but it goes from the lowest to the highest in nice sequence. But the guitar is all screwed up because each one of these strings is chopped, chopped and then like arranged on top of each other. So you, you and, and they overlap even parts right. of them. So uh, this, this string repeats itself finally after all of these notes, but it gets to, after only five notes, it's already onto this next string, which is the same for that string and that string. So you can't, it's harder to play, uh, B flats and F sharps, you know, on a guitar kind of, and E flat. E flat is not the uh, not the easiest chord, but on a piano they're really easy and quite comfortable and preferable. And um, vice versa, some of the chords on you know like a, the G's and C's maybe are kind of more boring to play on the piano because they're they're simple. C sharp. Not, a, not as fun to play. You have to bar chord to be able to add in C sharps. Uh, but this guitar is actually, for those astute ears out there and you're saying, wait a minute, that doesn't sound like he's playing it in the actual, uh, in the actual tuning. And that's correct because I've tuned all of these strings equally down uh, four steps for reasons that I, I wish to keep to myself. No, I did that because it, it just gives it a richer, deeper sound. And I'm, and I'm trying to explore different things. We're circling back to your thing about songwriting. Um, I, I detune guitars and retune guitars. I remove strings sometimes just to, to play them in a different way. And I discover things easier. I can't discover as easy on the cliched instruments. Right. You said there was questions on Facebook. Uh, well, Randy, why don't you take a look? 
when I know that our time is uh, grown so short. Uh, this uh, we don't want to abort the show. That just means to end it, folks. That's all I meant to say. <laughs> there you go. Is there uh, any instrument that you think it's not possible to improvise uh, with? Oh, I should have brought out some, you know, I, my son's got all kinds of fun, bizarre instruments. Um, no, any any that are, did, you should not improvise? Is that what the question was? Yeah, I mean. What do you got, what are you got against, uh, are you mad? You got hate against triangles or something? <laughs> What's wrong with the triangle? I will okay, say the I triangle, mean... triangle is pretty specific. And uh, you got to wait around for that one moment that it, it really makes sense. But when it does, you're going to be glad you brought that triangle. Right. Yeah. Down of the thing. And my symbols. I'll bring my symbols on. That's right. Twice a night, I can hit. Symbols. The artist formerly known as Prince, who wasn't he a symbol? <laughs> I thought, or no. Ha uh ha. -huh. <laughs> um, in terms of formats, musical formats, not games. Uh, because you directed a lot of the formats and we're going to be wrapping stuff up here in a minute but and i have uh, some really uh, interesting ones on the horizon but uh ideas oh, cool. to me they're awesome. interesting to the rest of the world they are uh, uh, probably not but <laughs> cool i look forward to hearing about them but uh or ones you've seen or been in in other places since you've lived in other towns and done improv uh are there any particular favorites really like, well that was a really great use of music in a format um and it, it I, I'm assuming it's a musical format, so it's singing songs or doing something, but it doesn't have to. It could be underscoring as well. If you've seen something, going, that's a really great use of, um, of a musician. Um, you know, I haven't seen anything in the per year for obvious reasons, because nothing's really been, there's, it's been weird. But even prior to that, um, I, 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 haven't, I haven't seen a ton of like new uh, uh, format, musical idea formats or anything like that. But I'm really intrigued again by the technical abilities that can happen um, with the ability with a, 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 the internet to be able to pull up so many different kinds of underscoring music or beats or you know you can you can just Google search or you go to YouTube or whatever and you can find and I'm not even talking about you know like copyright music or something like that I'm talking about like you could type in 60 beat per minute drum, you know, a reggae drum beat or something like that. Boom, there it is. How can we apply that to an improv uh, show that, that we use that? So the improvisers are constantly, you know, having, because we usually have a musician that's that's doing that. So, so play us a new song there, so-and-so, and, and now play us a new genre. Great, thank you. But how much more we can do with all of the connection to the internet and playing together, perhaps having a guy in New York playing something on our screen, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's, it's, it's really interesting and it's, and it's technical and uh, uh, it's a lot of it is, um, hasn't really been applied yet in, I think in, in our world, our improv world. And some of it has, you know, ideas like those, uh, the, the, the um, what's the slideshow that's the, um, you know defining slides behind you that you turn around and you see right I, I, the the shows where you're dubbing uh, videos and things like that there's you know com there's there's got to be many many different more applications than just dubbing videos that can be used in an instantaneous using the the world wide web but i digress all right so you're excited about the application of technology to serve music randy i'm excited and i'm terrified at the same time because i feel that humanity has a grave responsibility. And with great responsibility, no, it's the other way around. <laughs> All right. Well, um, thank you, Ron. I have one last question for you, though. Yes. Uh, and I have four answers. Uh, uh, again, those of you who know Ron and I uh, know that we are huge Beatle fans, in addition <laughs> to uh, others. Are you excited about this whole new Peter Jackson? restoration re-edit of the let it be film uh there's a lot of jokes that i can make but i won't i'll just say sincerely it's the most excited I, it's, i'm thrilled i'm thrilled uh my uh i have a, a social group music group that i get together with uh and we we discuss and it's like a book club for music uh and and, so, and we're all very excited about that but i talked to them a lot about how um the the, the album let it be 
is this is a great conclusion, I guess, and that is that uh, for me, my um, what is my touchstone, my uh, grail, whatever it is, is the album Let It Be. It's it's summarizes the earliest dawning of my consciousness, and it's the music that specific album has been from the beginning with me. And uh, I might even have the actual original album here somewhere, but um, so I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled and because that album, despite all of the Phil Spector uh, stuff, which I didn't think served it well, it's, it's still fundamental. I wouldn't have it any other way because it's just how I know the album. But all of these versions that they have, all of the, uh, for those of you who might not know, there's hundreds of hours of footage that was filmed to the Beatles during this rehearsal. Um, concluding with the rooftop concert and it was edited in different ways and re-edited and never really decided that this is the, the real version. In fact, it was supposed to be an album that came out before Abbey Road, but then it didn't. The whole thing is just a real patched mess and yet it's so perfect. And, uh, and I'll, I'll try to sum this up quickly. What I think is supremely great about that album and why I think that's a unique album in the Beatles canon and why I think it holds up, it sounds more modern in a lot of ways than a lot of their other albums is because so much of that album is actually live. It's actually performed <clears throat> live on the roof and or live in the studio. And that was something that they didn't do with Sgt. Pepper. They didn't do with the White Album. They didn't do with Abbey Road. They didn't do with any of these studio wizardry trickery albums, which they spent so much time overdubbing each component mm -hmm. part that it loses a live feel that, that that instantaneous back and forth, you heard that I'm speeding up, you heard that I'm slowing down, I'm emoting a little more and you follow me and I follow you. That little sprinkling is in that album and that makes it so alive. And it's my favorite album of any album of any artist of all time. Wow. That's, that's big praise. So, indeed. And I can add to that by saying I like it a lot. No, um, <laughs> no, I'm I'm excited to to see what see what happens. So. When I'm talking here with Randy Dixon, speaking on this Zoom machine, speaking words of wisdom. Let me be. All right, I'll let you be. Oh, I hope we don't have copyright issues. With that. Uh, we'll find out. Um, anyway, Ron, thank you so much for spending the last hour um, discussing things improv, things music. Uh, if you enjoyed this, watching this hour, um, feel free to make a donation, unexpectedproductions.org. Again, we have classes and shows that can be found there as well. And um, yeah, next week I'll be joined by, I don't have the schedule right in front of me, but I believe it's uh, actor, improviser from London, Alan Cox will be here to uh, talk things improv and things elsewhere. But uh, special thanks to uh, Ron Hippie. Thank you, Randy. Randy Dixon, everybody. Get back!